Hello, and welcome back to Philosophy 1050, an introduction to philosophy. This is Lecture 3. This time, we'll be covering two philosophers, Plato and Socrates. Plato is said to be one of the most comprehensive philosophers, meaning that he stuck his toes in just about everything. Metaphysics, epistemology, value theory, you name it, he did it. He was born into an Athenian aristocratic family, so he is pretty well off, and was the disciple of Socrates. Plato founded the first school of philosophy and went on to be the teacher of Aristotle, who is another huge philosopher that we'll cover in our later lectures. Um, Plato advised kings, and he wrote lots of different stories called dialogues. Dialogues. And they were called dialogues because uh, they were accounts, real or otherwise, of discussions had by people on certain topics. Uh, prominently, Plato's teacher, being Socrates, uh, was front and center in most of his dialogues. Uh, the topics ranged across most subjects, but the techniques which were employed were relatively novel. Um, specifically, Plato pioneered the argument from analogy, which uh, we saw used in Mary Midgley's essay, and argument based on the definitions of words, which is something that he got from Socrates. In all, Plato wanted to establish a better society by improving the people within, within it, and this was largely due to the influence that Socrates had on him. Uh, when Plato was in his twenties, uh, he witnessed Socrates speak to many people on many different subjects, and later saw Socrates defend himself against the death penalty. Uh, Socrates carried great weight in uh, Plato's wife, uh, in, <laughs> in Plato's life, and, his, and as his teacher. Uh, so when Socrates ended up being put to death, Plato was very heavily affected, <coughs> and so Plato decided to carry on Socrates's. Uh, legacy by writing about it. Now, Socrates himself never wrote anything down. Uh, being lowborn and constantly in poverty, he couldn't. He probably couldn't even afford writing tools. Uh, his main ability lied in his speech, and so consequently, all we know about him is what other people wrote about him. Most specifically, Plato. Um, Ultimately, Socrates was convicted and given the death sentence uh, by the city of Athens, but we'll go into the details of that uh, uh, in our following lectures. We'll also uh, talk more about Socrates and the methods he employed a little later, but for now it suffices to say that Socrates' main tactic was honing in on particular definitions of words and people's understandings of them, and showing how those understandings were actually a little bit flawed, or lacking, or even incoherent. So, uh, Plato, perhaps inspired by this fact, created a philosophy which centered around something he called forms. Now, this is an important term. Forms. So, forms are the perfect version of uh, something, and they exist in a separate realm than this world, kind of like Pythagoras' realm of numbers. Um, now, Different objects of the same type, like an apple, for example, have in common something, says Plato, and they have in com what that thing that they have in common is the form of an apple. So you have two, let's say, apples here. You know, one is a little bit better than the other, and they're different. But because they're both apples, they have this like perfect sort of idea of appleness. Now I'm gonna probably gonna screw this up, but. Whatever, let's just say that's a perfect apple. So in the world of forms, there's this sort of like appleness out there, and that's what different apples have in common. And the same thing you could do with lots of different things. So uh, dogs, different kinds of dogs, they have in common an idea of doghood. Um, and this most perf mo uh, best can be imagined through uh, the example of triangles. So you have different kinds of triangles. Right? You have a square triangle, an isosceles triangle, an equilateral, or a triangular <laughs> equilateral, and all these types of triangles have in common some perfect kind of triangle hood that is describable by mathematics and all the relationships that triangles have. Um, 
But the perfect triangle doesn't exist in the world. Even if I was like a perfect robot, I could perfectly draw a triangle, it still wouldn't be a perfect uh, triangle because first of all, the lines are fat, so it's actually a, you know not perfect lines. Um, and uh, not only that, but no matter how small you get, eventually you're gonna get some sort of imperfection. Uh, so triangles, apples, trees, people, color, friendship, justice, goodness, and the list goes on. All these things have examples in the world and perfect examples in the world of forms, according to Plato. Uh, and moreover, the things that exist in the world of forms are grasped by the intellect, uh, sort of, again, following in Pythagoras's sort of uh, conception. So uh, you can't touch or see uh, the perfect apple, but you can think and uh, contemplate on what makes the perfect apple. And by that, you're kind of reaching at it through your reason. Now, there's a famous story of Plato's, Mino, uh, and we're not covering it in this course, but feel free to read it uh, on your free time, uh, which talks about the idea that anyone can grasp knowledge of forms. So the issue at hand in this story is something called the paradox of knowledge. So the question is, let me get rid of these here. When you're looking for something, uh, there's a problem. Because either the thing you're looking for is something you already know, or the thing you're looking to find out is something that you don't know. Now, this seems pretty obvious. You're trying to figure something out, and you either know that thing already, or you don't. But what's, so what's the problem? Well, if you don't know what you're looking for, goes the argument, then how do you know it, uh, how can you recognize it when you've figured it out, uh, when you've learned it? If you don't know it already, then you can't match it to something that you're expecting. Conversely, if you already know the thing that you're looking, uh, looking to find out, then what's the point of searching at all? You already know it. And so this presented something called the paradox of knowledge. And uh, in Mino, Socrates uh, solves this problem by uh, showing, giving an example. Um, specifically, uh, the thing he wants to establish is that it's not that we already know or don't know, it's that we uh, knew it in a past life but we forgot it, and when we uh, learn something, we're actually remembering it. So he did this by basically, he was over at Mino's house, and Mino had uh, a young servant. So Socrates co uh, calls over the young servant, who presumably doesn't know anything about anything, and Socrates goes like this. Okay, so I have this straight line, and I have another straight line. If this angle is equal to this angle, then what is this angle equal to? And the slave, servant, slave, again, it's a little bit more of a complicated category. It's not the same sort of slavery we associate with what happened in America. In any case, um, the uh, servant instantly was like, well, that angle then must be equal to this angle. And he completed the puzzle without knowing anything. And so Socrates used this as evidence that, in fact, we already have the knowledge, so we do already know it, it's just we forgot it. By being born, we lost all the knowledge we gained in our past life by forgetting it. But it's still there somewhere, and so when you learn something, it comes back to you. Um, Now, we'll cover more about Socrates' method and Plato's theory of forms a little bit later, but for now, I think it's just helpful to have brief, briefly mentioned them. Uh, we have details, uh, plenty of details to get bogged down in as it is, so let's move on. So, this lecture, we're going to be focusing on Plato's euthyphro. So let's make a little bit of room for that. So, the Euthyphro dialogue takes place outside of the courthouse before Socrates' trial. Uh, the trial itself takes place in a later dialogue, the dialogue we'll be covering in the next lecture. Here Socrates meets and talks to an expert in religious matters named Euthyphro. And he asks Euthyphro to teach Socrates about holiness and piety. 
uh, Euthyphro attempts to do so, uh, but all the answers that he gives about what holiness and piety are, are found faulty by Socrates. So in the end, Socrates doesn't get the answer to his question. And again, let's be very specific. The question is, what is holiness or unholiness? and piety slash impiety. So Socrates is asking you, Thyphro, just ex you're the expert here in the religious matters, and these are religious things. Can you just explain to me what does holiness mean? What does piety mean? I'm about to go to trial for supposedly not being pious enough, so maybe if you help me out here, I'll be able to argue better. And Euthyphro, being very confident in his own abilities, happily attempts to help out. So this really is a classic setup for a Socratic dialogue. Socrates speaks to someone who is supposed to be knowledgeable about a subject and asks them very basic questions about that subject that those people claim to know very well. Uh, those basic questions are answered pretty poorly, leading either to contradictions or things that they don't want to say. And so Socrates demonstrates that in fact, the, that expert is not so wise, or not as wise as he claimed to be. In fact, in some cases, they even look like a fool at the end of it. And understandably, Socrates doesn't make a lot of friends this way. So, many of Plato's uh, dialogues follow this format, with Socrates being the main character that's questioning. Um, and it speaks to Socrates' overall mission, which we'll learn more about as we uh, get into the next lecture. But for now, let's just cl get clear on what's happening here in the Euthyphro dialogue. So Euthyphro tells Socrates uh, that he's in the process of prosecuting his father for murder, and that this is the pious thing to do. Socrates, seemingly pleased that Euthyphro is so much of an expert that he's confident in, you know, prosecuting his own father, uh, in reality, Socrates may have been a little bit uh, sarcastic, saying to Euthyphro, oh, you, you must really know what you're doing if you're prosecuting your father, but that's neither here nor there. In any case, since Socrates himself is being prosecuted for creating new gods, he asks Euthyphro to accept him as a student, to teach him about the gods and holiness and piety. Thus, Socrates uh, would have uh, Euthyphro believe uh, it, this, uh, sorry, is so that he can better defend himself in court. But in reality, what's ra probably happening here is Socrates doesn't expect much from Euthyphro. In any case, uh, before we go on, it's important to say a little bit about Euthyphro's case against his father. So Euthyphro's father tied up a known murderer, who he just saw murder someone, and waited for a message from Athens to tell him what to do with that murderer. While he was waiting for that message from Athens, the murderer was like lying on the ground, tied up, and he died of, you know, starvation or exposure or dehydration. Doesn't matter. He died just because he was tied up and couldn't move. And so Euthyphro considers this to be murder. And in our society today, we would probably agree with Euthyphro because in our society today, even if someone is a murderer, you can't just cruelly and unjustly uh, tie them up and let them die of starvation. Um, but in Greek society, it wasn't so clear. So for our purposes here, let's just allow that Euthyphro's case isn't so obviously good or bad in of itself. And his confidence uh, is surprising to Socrates. So let's just allow that it makes sense that Socrates is surprised at how confident Euthyphro is. So then, Socrates begins with the simple question. What is holiness, no holiness, piety, and impiety? In this, Socrates is specifying that he understands holiness and unholiness to be properties of different actions that they can have in common. And so Socrates wants to know what that thing is that they have in common, or thinking back to the forms, he wants to know what the form of holiness is. He wants to know what the form of piety is. He doesn't want just examples. Uh, so Euthyphro's first answer is pretty un unsatisfying. His first answer is, piety is what I'm doing. Prosecuting 
no matter who it is. So, prosecuting impiety no matter who it is, like the way Zeus prosecuted his father. And that's the first answer that Euthyphro gives. Socrates, at this point, verifies whether Euthyphro actually believes in these stories about the gods and what they do to each other, including going to war with each other. And uh, Socrates confirms that he does actually believe these things happen. And although this seems out of place, it will be important later. Um, so Socrates announces his dissatisfaction with Euthyphro's answer, and he explains why. Uh, Euthyphro, you have given me an ostensive, that's a key word, ostensive definition. And not a definition of holiness in, in itself. I'm asking you, what is the ideal form of holiness? Now, what does ostensive mean? Ostensive means uh, defining something through ex by giving examples. So if I was to ostensively define dog to you, I would point to a bunch of dogs being like, dog, 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 dog. And you'd see all the dogs and your brain would do the rest of the work and you'd be like, ah, yes, dog, it's that kind of thing. But that's not what Socrates is looking for. He doesn't want uh, Euthyphro to just point at stuff that is holy and have Socrates do the rest of the work. No, Socrates wants Euthyphro to clearly define what holiness is. So Euthyphro tries again. What is holy is what is pleasing to the gods. So here's his second attempt at giving Socrates an answer to what is holy. And uh, here is where Socrates' question to Euthyphro about whether he believes in the stories of the gods actually comes in. Because if the gods do go to war, as Euthyphro claims, then they must agree on what they find pleasing. And if they di disagree on what they find pleasing, then uh, certain things can be considered both holy and unholy at the same time, which is a complete contradiction. So Socrates asks whether this is a problem for Euthyphro's picture and his confidence in the holiness of his case against his father. Well, Euthyphro replies that, well, all the gods agree that you must prosecute who is, uh, you know, you got to prosecute the murders. But Socrates, in turn, replies, well, obviously they agree that you must prosecute murders. But, uh, I mean, everybody agrees on that. But the real question is whether or not your, what your father did counts as murder. And just as humans might disagree on that, then perhaps the gods might disagree on that. So doesn't that worry you, Euthyphro? Um, at this point, Socrates challenges Euthyphro to kind of prove that his case is holy, uh, but then he pulls back because he can kind of tell Euthyphro is getting uncomfortable. And uh, so he starts stroking Euthyphro's ego again by saying, ah, now nah, I'm sure you can do it in court. I'm not going to bother you now with that. Uh, so Euthyphro, of course, agrees. Yeah, no, I'll do it in court. Don't worry about it. And uh, so then Socrates throws Euthyphro some more rope, suggesting a new definition for uh, uh, what is holy and unholy. So the next uh, definition that he gives is holiness, or the holy, is what all the gods love. So this way we get past the whole uh, them disagreeing thing. If the holy is only the things that all the gods love. Uh, now, let's see here. Euthyphro agrees with this definition as it seems good enough and uh, he's eager to sort of, you know, get a win in this conversation because so far, you know, he's kind of been stumbling. Socrates, however, after setting him up, knocks him down with one of the most infamous problems in ethics, and even to this day. So the question is, uh, is holiness, sorry, is something holy because the gods love it? Or do the gods love it 
because it is holy. Now take a moment to consider that for a moment. So we're saying that, is it the case that uh, something is holy just because the gods love it? Or do the gods love something because they recognize it as holy? And they're not the ones making it holy by loving it. It's just already holy. They notice it and being like, oh, I love that. So these are the two options here. In one case, something is uh, loved, uh, or sorry, something is holy just because it's loved. And in the other case, it's loved because it is holy. Now, uh, after dropping this, Socrates continues to steamroll Euthyphro by talking about how words like the word love get used in language. So if something is carried, led, or seen, it's because someone is leading, carrying it, or seeing it. It's not the other way around. Someone doesn't see something because it is seen. Rather, something is seen because someone sees it. And so this applies to love as well. A thing is loved because someone loves it, not the other way around. Someone has to initiate the loving of an object for that object to be loved. It's not that the object simply is loved and then someone comes and, uh, and causes someone to love it. So if we apply this to the dilemma that Socrates presented earlier, then we're led to the notion that something is holy because the gods love it. Or, in other words, something is loved by the gods because the gods initiated the loving of it. Furthermore, Socrates asks Euthyphro if the gods love the things they love because they are holy. So it's like, well, why do gods love things? Well, they love things because they're holy. And so Euthyphro agrees to that. But, Socrates continues, if that's the case, then we've created a circular definition. Things are holy because gods love them, and the gods love them because they're holy. Euthyphro hasn't actually explained anything. So at this point, Euthyphro gets flustered and suggests uh, that Socrates isn't playing fair, like Daedalus. I, I think I'm saying that right. It, it's a mythical sculptor whose uh, sculptures came to life and moved around on their own. Uh, so Socrates once again resets, knowing that Euthyphro is getting flustered, and asks Euthyphro if they can try again. Euthyphro agrees. So this time, Socrates asks a different question. So let's uh, yeah, let's get rid of this for now. So the next question Socrates asks is, is everything that is holy also just? So if it is holy, then it is just. Uh, and is it not also true that all just and it, is it true that not all justice is holy so you have so if this is justice and here it is then there's at least a whole section of it over here maybe bigger or larger or smaller which doesn't have to do with holiness. So there's justice that's completely, you know, on human matters. If so, if everything that is holy is just, but not everything that is justice is holy, then we can conclude that holiness is a subcategory of justice. So Socrates continues, what part of justice is it? Euthyphro replies, well, it's the part of justice that has to do with service to the gods. Socrates then asks, okay, so what is service to the gods? Is it like caring for the welfare of something? Is it like how a horse trainer cares for his horses? Euthyphro agrees up until the point Socrates points out that this kind of care uh, is something that's aimed at bettering its subject. The horse trainer trains the horse to make the horse better. So does Euthyphro want to say that serving the gods makes the gods better, as if they could be improved upon? Certainly not, says Euthyphro. 
So what kind of service is it then, says Socrates? Um, Euthyphro suggests that's the kind of service that a slave gives to their master uh, or, uh, you know, a son gives to their father. Socrates so refines Euthyphro's definition then with his agreement to be holiness is the science of prayer and sacrifice. Holiness is the science of prayer and sacrifice. So, but Socrates asks, what do the gods need that they don't already have? Now, Euthyphro suggests that they gain nothing except things like worship, honor, and goodwill, because it's not as though they need the goats that are being sacrificed. What would a god need with a goat? So what they're in it for, according to Euthyphro, is worship, honor, and goodwill. But, Socrates points out, if you do this, then we're back to where we started. And holiness, then, would be what the gods love. So we haven't actually gotten anywhere, because if what the gods want, or rather, if holiness is prayer and sacrifice, and sacrifice is about giving the gods what they want, then we're back where we started. Holiness is what the gods love. So Socrates asks Euthyphro one last time to explain what is holiness. And this time Euthyphro storms off, being like, ah, another time, Socrates. So to recap, Socrates started the conversation with a simple question. What is holiness or piety? Euthyphro attempts to say that holiness is what he's doing, then he, that holiness is what the gods love, then that it is what all the gods love, and then that holiness is part of justice, it is a service to the gods, and then he went back to holiness being what the gods love again. So Socrates, in his classic style, runs Euthyphro around in circles just trying to get a basic answer out of him. Every explanation that Euthyphro gives, Socrates analyzes in terms of its meaning and finds it either to be self-contradictory or otherwise to imply something that Euthyphro really doesn't want to say, like, you can improve the gods. The most famous part of this dialogue, as I have mentioned, is the dilemma that Socrates poses to Euthyphro. Do the gods love something because it is holy? Or is something holy because the gods love it? This problem arises as a thorn in the side of ethicists uh, want to say that there is something uh, about being good uh, and bad that doesn't have to do with our preferences. It's if, um, if something is good simply because we like it, then there's nothing more to it being good than us liking it. Or in other words, there's nothing at play other than subjectivity. Conversely, if something is good independent of whether or not we like it, then it seems that there is some sort of moral force not only above us, but in the case of the gods, it'd be something above the gods, because if the gods love only the holy things, but they don't get to choose what are the holy things, then there's something else other than the gods choosing what is holy and unholy. Well, with that, I think that concludes our lecture now on Euthyphro. Uh, join us next time where we're going to be covering uh, the trial of Socrates in the uh, Plato's dialogue titled The Apology.